So meetings. All right, so the first, the first thing that we want to think about with meetings is, how do we already think about meetings? I mean, when you think, ah, okay, tomorrow I'm going to be back in my office and I have a day full of meetings. Like, <laughs> what, what does that conjure for you? Do you say, yes, I'm really looking forward to tomorrow? You're like, ooh, I'm not looking forward to tomorrow. So the first thing we're trying to do even before we try to act differently about meetings, is we want to think differently about meetings. Um, and this isn't just kind of self-talk. This is really thinking about them as a different opportunity than we currently think about them. So uh, Ron Heifetz and Marty Linsky, Ron Heifetz is at the Harvard Kennedy School, and he's worked with several colleagues over many years on adaptive and technical leadership. Um, this may be a familiar concept to some of you, but at a really high level, they talk about adaptive challenges as something that you don't already know the answer to, or you have to change core values and beliefs to really make it work. So the adaptive challenge related to meetings is really reframing them as learning opportunities. So instead of thinking of them as things you have to go to, think of them as opportunities for adult learning to happen. All right, so that's the adaptive challenge. How do you change the mindset, the way we think about something? And then they also talk about technical challenges. Technical challenges are things that we already have the know-how to do. We just, for whatever reason, aren't doing them. And most leadership challenges that we face have both elements to them, adaptive parts and technical parts. Very often in leadership, we tend to focus on the technical parts and not the adaptive. But you can also kind of misfocus by only focusing on adaptive and not technical. So if you said, oh, okay, we're gonna really think about meetings as adult learning opportunities, but you didn't also change some of the technical aspects, you probably wouldn't get there. So the technical challenge with meetings is making sure that when you're planning the meeting, you really remember everything we already know about what makes a great meeting. That part isn't rocket science, right? Like we don't need to spend a lot of time this morning assembling what we think a great meeting looks like because you already know that. But yet if you're anything like me, not every meeting you have fits with what you know to be a great meeting. So what we're going to work on this morning is how to get tomorrow a day you look forward to of meetings and, and all your meetings thereafter. How do you get closer both with the adaptive part and the technical part? So just cut to the chase here. What do we know about resource use? So here's the very number one finding, even though the research literature is not fabulous about resource use, because it's really hard to follow from a resource to what happens and trace any kind of causal linkage. But this is, this is very clear from the research, which is that quality matters more than quantity. So whenever I'm talking with people about improving learning and teaching, one of the things that comes up is that we don't have enough time. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough time for the adult learning we want to do. We don't have enough time with the children. That's often true, and sometimes we don't have enough money. Um, sometimes we don't have what we think are enough people, all of those things. But it's also true that I always think you need a baseline of quantity, but once you have the baseline, really got to focus on the quality. So make sure you're maxing out the quality of what you have before you look for more quantity. This is especially true, I think, for time, because it may feel like we don't have enough time for adult learning, but are we maxing out every minute that we already have? So that's what we're going to focus on, is maxing out the time you've already got. And then it becomes a lot more clear what you need more time for, and people are much more persuaded that you'll make good use of it um, once you've maxed out the quality. So. We're going to think about that a little bit this morning. So if you, if you want to go for improvement, last time we talked about improvement at a very broad kind of level. Here we're going to talk much more granularly about, you know what, we could just tomorrow try to use our meetings better. So we could do that. We could help other people do the same. And we could also really think about our meetings a little differently. So I want you to do this actual math problem that I'm about to put up, which is pick a meeting that you either attend regularly um, or a meeting that's, that's, that's common in your life and calculate how much your organization invests in it. So you could either think about 
if you're in a school or if you're in a school system, what are all the meetings that happen there in a week? Or you could pick one meeting, like, hey, we have our regular principals meeting or something like that, or a leadership team meeting, and calculate that. So what you're going to do is actually you can use technology if you want. Calculator is most welcome. But think about time as money. So my colleague Richard Elmore says, time is money you already spent because you already bought people's time, because you're paying them. So if time is money you already spent, think about approximately, just estimating, what is an hour of somebody's time at that meeting cost, and how much time are they spending in the meeting, right? So take the meeting. Some of you are already making faces, all right? Good, that's good. That's the whole point of this exercise, is to dollarize the meeting for a minute, just to help you think about it a little bit differently. So, so pull out your, your pencils or your calculators, choose that meeting, and I want you to do the math problem. All right, let's hear some, some numbers out. Tell us which meeting it is and what you got. OK, $24,000 for a team that meets twice a month for an hour each time. OK, $24,000. What else, what else do people calculate? OK, so building level leadership meeting, $450 an hour. So just imagine if you thought about it that way and you thought, wow, we just spent 200 bucks getting ready to meet. They're getting everybody here. You know, we just spent $450 on that discussion of that logistical thing. Was that like how we wanted to spend our time? So, so just so if you added that up over the year. Okay, so you picked one meeting and you, you estimated that over time. If you, if you did try to do it all, all the meetings in a week or all the meetings in a year, you would start getting pretty large sums, right? Because you have $24,000 for one meeting that's, that's twice a month. So again, think about time is money you already spent. If you think about those meetings as an investment, you know, you're investing in the adults there, are you getting your return on investment from the potential learning that could happen in those meetings? So that's, that's what we're going to talk more about in this session. In chapter seven of the book that you have, Meeting Wise, we talk about four entry points to becoming Meeting Wise. So I'm gonna offer those to you here just as a frame for where we're focusing. Because you could actually try to improve your return on investment of meetings through any of these venues. We're gonna pick one today, but you could pick a different one. And the book has resources for you on all four of them, so I just wanted to frame them for you. The first one, is simply to make better agendas for each of those meetings. So if you said that next meeting is $450 um, an hour, it's a two hour meeting, 900 bucks, I'm gonna make sure that agenda is worth $900, at least going in. All right, so you, you work on making better agendas. Um, and there's some resources uh, available to you up in addition to this, a few resources, not a lot, but up on the Harvard GSC website. The second one is that you can invest in a firm foundation for meetings. So these are some things that you're quite familiar with, but if you, again, think about the gamut of your meetings, sometimes that foundation isn't there. Just because people assume we're professionals, we're adults, we don't actually need to do things like set norms or just make sure our routines are set or make sure it's clear how we're communicating and which technologies we're using and get that set up. So even though I, some of the feedback I heard after last time was, Meetings sound great, but please, please, can we not set norms? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm fine with not setting norms together. Um, but I do think that it's very helpful in meetings that are regular and ongoing to make sure you have a set of norms and are checking up on them. Um, the trick is always the checking up on them part. So, so that, that second way could just be, sometimes it's backtracking if some of that foundation isn't there. And some of, sometimes it's, um, if you're starting a new set of meetings, just make sure you invest a little bit that can pay off in the long run. The, this is some examples of what the things are, like agenda templates, figuring out how people like to work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the third one is to improve facilitation and participation. And the basic idea is here is no matter how beautiful that agenda is, like you have real people in the room and different things happen sometimes once you have the meeting happening. So how do you improve facilitation? And not just that, the facilitator isn't the only one responsible for having a great meeting. The participants are also responsible and can do a lot of things to make the meetings better. So how do you improve facilitation and participation? And we offer 
kind of four buckets in which to think about that. One is keeping to the agenda and deviating from it when needed and figuring out which of those is the right thing to do sometimes is tricky. Um, the second one, which we're gonna focus quite a bit on today in a way with task, is supporting full engagement. How do you make sure that you get everybody in the room involved? Because if they're not, what's the point of having them in the room? All right, so how do you get the benefit of all those people in the room? The third is managing conflict. Most of us in our meetings aren't very facile with that, so what does that look like from both the facilitator's perspective and the participants? And the last one is helping everybody in the room maintain awareness of the role they are playing in the meeting and own that and use it for the good of the objectives. So that's, that's improving facilitation and participation. And then the last one is just addressing common meeting dilemmas. I mean, again, we could sit around and I could say, so what are some of the things that come up in meetings? And you guys would say things like, well, one person talks all the time, or people don't come prepared, or we always run out of time, or, um, the elephant still sits in the room and we're not sure what to do about it. Um, all of those kinds of things are really common meeting dilemmas. So what you could do is just tackle the elephant in the room. What is it? And let's go after it. So you could start with any of those things. We're going to start with making better agendas. Because in my experience, that is usually pretty low hanging fruit to make meetings better. And it's something you can do tomorrow, which then helps people start thinking differently about meetings, as I said. So that's what we're going to focus on this morning. To do that, you have a tool on your table and you read about it in preparation for today called the Meeting Wise Checklist. So you read a little bit about why do we think it's important to use a checklist in the first place. And I'll say a couple words here for the video, but also just to, to frame it for you from my perspective, which is I'm not really a checklisty kind of a person. I, I ascribe more to the constructivist way of making meaning and constructing learning experiences, not the, hey, we should just be able to have a checklist. But if you think back to the point I made about technical pieces, we actually do know a lot of things about meetings. So th this checklist idea came about when my co-author, Kathy Baudet, and I um, were all excited about a book we had read called The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande, who's a surgeon in the Boston area. He writes a lot of great stuff about improvement. And we read The Checklist Manifesto, and we were all excited. We were like, this sounds so great. You know, he writes about how um, professionals use checklists and how um, in the medical profession, you know, surgeons uh, know that they should not leave instruments in people's bodies. They know that. And yet, sometimes they do it. Right? So they know better than they do that. Similarly, medical professionals know that they need to wash their hands. But yet, very often people get sicker from going to the hospital than they were when they went in, if that's ever happened to you or a loved one. Um, and so, in both of those examples, Gawande writes about how using checklists dropped the error rate dramatically. So people knew very darn good and well what they were supposed to do, but for a variety of reasons it just wasn't happening. But when they instituted checklists, the error rate, which in this case saved lives, um, dropped dramatically. The yeah. idea is that professionals use checklists, which was kind of counterintuitive for me because I thought, well, professionals kind of know what they're doing already. Part of being a professional is it's assumed you know what you're doing and so you shouldn't have to use tools like that. But Kathy and I got to thinking, we said, well, is there anything that in our worlds where you could use a checklist and it would help? And I was like, no, education's too much of an art. There's some science, but there's all this art to it. And then we thought, you know what, meetings. Because in our work, it turns out that most of what we end up spending time helping people do is collaborate productively. So the content can seem like it's about something else. It's about using data, it's about strategy, it's about um, how do you observe in classrooms, it's, it's about how do you improve faster. It can seem all those things, but at bottom line, most of what we end up helping people with is collaboration. And so we thought, is there a checklist that would help people with collaboration? And so over several years, we played with this checklist, we, we piloted out, and Here's where we landed, 12 things that can help you have a better meeting. Now you may have some items on there that aren't as relevant or you want to add some, go for it. We don't think this is the, the final word on what makes awesome meetings, but we do think that if you use it, it will help you in your meetings. Thank you.